again. <laughs> um, you can hear me, I hope. Raise your hand if you can, so I know you can. I can't hear you because you're on mute, so thank you. Um, so welcome to DNR Greenway's reemergence of our happy hours. We did a whole series of these last year into the fall, I and this hear. is the first one we've done since November. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, so tonight is going to be a very special program on astrophotography over our St. Michael's Farm Preserve. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we got here. Um, but let me just remind you, as a nonprofit land trust, our mission is to preserve and care for land and to seek to inspire a conservation ethic. And I know from having seen some of these wonderful photographs that after tonight, you will be inspired to ensure that our, our natural world is protected. It is amazing to see what is actually up there. Um, so there has been a lot going on over our heads this year. Um, I was fascinated to read about some of the star phenomena this year. We had Comet Neowise in July of 2020, and that was the brightest comet in the Northern Hemisphere in decades. And I hope some of you were able to see, as I was, the Christmas star conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in the night sky this past December. That was pretty exciting because it was seen for the first time in 800 years. So before we start this fascinating program, I just want to tell you about the next one we'll be doing, which will be on May 16th from 4.30 to 5.30 will be DNR Greenway's virtual gala. Uh, we do a gala every year. Last year was the first virtual one. And this year we will be celebrating the preservation of Point Breeze, which is the former estate of Joseph Napoleon Bonaparte located in Bordentown. It is going to be a very exciting program. We have some surprise speakers lined up for you. So I hope you're able to come back and join us and keep an eye out for invitations that are going out in the mail, as well as our email announcements about the program. So you can sign up for that. So now to tonight's program. So I have to tell you, I was intrigued when our guest speaker, Taylor Blanchard, told me the skies over St. Michael's Farm Preserve are about as good as it gets in New Jersey. Well, I always thought St. Michael's was about as good as it gets, but to know the skies are that dark was just an amazing and wonderful thing to hear. Um, Taylor taught me about the Bortle scale, which I had not heard about. And you'll hear about and learn about it tonight, along with many different things about how astrophotography is done. And you'll see some incredible photos of what you see in the night sky through a telescope. But I have to say, when I first heard of astrophotography, I couldn't help but think of Star Trek. And I have to admit, the Jetsons. <laughs> some of you remember that. Um, so last summer, Taylor came to DNR Greenway and he contacted us to see if we would allow him to set up his equipment overnight at our St. Michael's Farm Preserve um, in the parking area that is just off of Princeton Avenue. And we really appreciated him coming to us to ask about that. Um, but how could we resist the opportunity? We made a deal with him, and that was that absolutely you can set up your equipment and take these incredible photographs if you share them with us. And he was happy to do that. And tonight he goes a step further by presenting on this incredible hobby that he has, um, which is just outstanding. Um, his background, he received a bachelor's degree in astrophysical sciences from Princeton University in 1977. He co-authored two papers published in the Astrophysical Journal. He received an MFA in stage design from New York University. So taking a little different turn there, he worked as a stage designer for several years. And um, he started painting in, in late 1980. And, and just before we all got on this uh, Zoom, uh, I was able to see some of his wildlife art, which is pretty outstanding. And I've invited him to be part of an exhibit at the Johnson Education Center when we reopen again, when it's safe to do so. Um, Taylor attended the first science fiction convention, which was in March of 1981. I bet some of you have heard of Comic-Con. This one was called Lunacon. 
Uh, he worked as a professional science fiction and fantasy art illustrator through 2010, and now he works as a science teacher with eighth grade science in the Lawrence schools. His lifelong love of astronomy and science have brought him to the hobby that he has that he'll talk to us about today. And he really brings together two of our cherished activities of DNR Greenway, the arts and um, observing the wonders of nature. So I think it's absolutely the perfect program um, and, and will be a fascinating talk. Um, this is a quote from Taylor. Art is how we express the wonders of the universe. Science is how we understand the wonders of the universe. So I'm going to turn it over to him now, and I'm going to ask all of you if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to enter those in the chat. I'll be monitoring those, and at the end of his presentation, we'll have some time for him to answer your questions. So I want to thank Taylor Blanchard for sharing his love of astrophotography with us tonight and invite him to take over the stage here. Welcome, Taylor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, what you see behind me, my uh, virtual background, is the uh, Hale Telescope in Mount Palomar Observatory in California. At one point, it was the largest telescope in the world. So I'm going to turn that off in a, for, in a moment. Uh, I have it on because I'm in my art studio right now. It's where I, I teach from if I'm not in the actual building. And so there's all kinds of junk everywhere. So I've got a green screen covering it up. I want to say a quick hi, Beckett. One of my students is actually here. One of my former students is actually here. Hello. So let me turn off my virtual background for just a moment. Because I want to show you, I'm going to be talking about doing astrophotography. This is the telescope. I wanted to hold it to give you an idea of size. It's not very large. This is the telescope that I use most of the time. I'm going to be getting another one. I've ordered one. Uh, this is the main scope going to about here. Uh, this is extension tubes. Uh, there is a filter drawer in here where I can pull filters in and out. And the red thing is the camera. That is the camera. Uh, it's a dedicated astronomy camera. It is cooled. So the camera can cool itself to uh, the, well, the manufacturer says that they can cool it to 40 degrees below ambient temperature. So in the summertime, you can usually go down to negative five degrees Celsius. And uh, in the wintertime, sometimes a bit lower, negative 20 degrees Celsius. And the reason you cool it is that astrophotographers are always fighting two things. The movement of the earth, because that makes the stars appear to move. So basically you're always photographing something that is moving and noise. With the digital cameras, you're getting noise from the circuitry of the camera itself, which can cause problems. So by cooling it, you have less noise. And there's a lot of other things we do to avoid noise. So I'm gonna share my screen. So this is the universe as I see it. The sky above St. Michael's. And I do wanna thank uh, Dean R. Greenway for giving me permission to uh, set up at St. Michael's. Uh, it can be difficult to find a place. One, it's difficult in this area to find a place that's dark. Two, it can be very, very difficult to find a place where you won't get chased out in the middle of the night. Uh, all of the parks in Lawrence are closed overnight. There is one park near me in Ewing where they don't care. I got managed to get permission, but it's I'm in Ewing Township. I'm relatively close to uh, Trenton. So that is a problem with light pollution. Uh, St. Michael's is ideally located in about as dark an area as you're going to get in this area. Uh, the Bortle scale goes from one to nine. Nine is like 
the middle of Manhattan or the middle of Tokyo. Uh, a one might be like Antarctica. Uh, St. Michael's is around a five or a four, which is really good. Uh, there's a dark site out in Pennsylvania that I think is like a three or a two. But um, most places in New Jersey, you cannot see the Milky Way. You simply cannot. There's too much light pollution. So every telescope, no matter how big or small, is an opportunity to learn, to explore, and to discover. And I liken the skies to the movie. Um, uh, there's a movie called uh, Second Sense, I, I forget it, uh, in which somebody can see, in which there are, are ghosts all over the place, but only one person can see it, or only a few people can see the ghosts, but they're everywhere. Only a few people can see them, though. And the sky is like that. The sky is filled with wonders. But only a few people can see them, the people with the telescope and the time. And let me give you an example right here. Now, this photograph was taken actually at Washington's Crossing. And it's a photograph of the sky taken with a 50 millimeter lens. And a 50 millimeter lens on a regular camera is about the equivalent to what the naked eye sees. And you may notice right here where I'm circling with the mouse, there is a, a star, kind of a fuzzy star. Well, it's fuzzy because it's not a star. It's the Andromeda galaxy. It's just about the farthest thing you can see with the naked eye. It's 2 million light years away. The light from that galaxy traveled for 2 million years before getting to my camera. With my telescope and my digital single lens reflex calendar, ca eh, camera, excuse me, that little dot, the Andromeda galaxy, looks like this. That was taken uh, August 2019. With better tracking and a little bit more time, this was taken September 19th. And then with more time from St. Michael's with my uh, dedicated astronomy camera, it's that, the Andromeda galaxy. And eventually I'll get an even better photograph of that. Uh, this is my best one of Andromeda to date. And that's the same thing that you were seeing at the naked eye, only you're only seeing that tiny little part. The camera can reveal things that our eye can't see, the telescope as well. And it can be truly amazing. This is a rather mediocre, mediocre photograph of the Orion uh, Nebula. I did not get a chance to go back and do a better one this winter. Uh, it's hard though to take a bad picture of the Orion Nebula. It is large, it is bright, and it is absolutely gorgeous. It is a striking uh, nebula that uh, astrophotographers come back to again and again and again because it is so beautiful. Uh, this thing over here is the Running Man Nebula over here. Uh, I was very happy with this at the time that I captured it. This was with my uh, digital single lens reflex camera and telescope. Uh, it's not as so, it's a bit noisier and I don't have as much detail. I definitely, I'm going to come back to Orion. This is a collection of, Mar of galaxies called Markarian's Chain. And I put this in here, even though it's not impressive in and of itself. Uh, my small telescope is not really the best scope for galaxies. One of the reasons that astrophotographers tend to have a lot of telescopes, and one of the reasons that 
this particular hobby, while glorious, um, is a bottomless money pit, uh, is the fact that no one scope is right for everything. Uh, this was pretty good to capture the cluster, but to get detail of the galaxy, not really so great. Uh, but what is fascinating about this is that there is a, uh, a service online where you can upload your photographs. I think it's called Astrometrics. And they will do something called plate solving and figure out uh, where it is, and they'll identify the deep space objects in the photograph. So for instance, you can look at this photograph and Markarian's chain, this is a section of, is a string of galaxies. So there's a galaxy here, there's one here, there's one here, another one there, obvious one there, one there. You can maybe find a few others. Here are all the galaxies in that one photograph. These are all the different galaxies. The main ones here. So basically the program will take your photograph and annotate it for you with all the different galaxies that it has in its database. And it's fascinating to see all the things that you don't notice at first glance. This is a photo of the Eastern Veil Nebula. Uh, I need to redo this, a bit fuzzy, but uh, this is a beautiful nebula. Uh, and when I refer to galaxies like this, these are gonna be outside our Milky Way. The nebulae are inside the Milky Way. So those galaxies, galaxies in Markarian's chain might be 16, 30, 50 light years away. And the, uh, the nebulae are gonna be on the order of just thousands of light years away. Now this, these are two different shots of the Triangulum Galaxy. Uh, this is a galaxy, I uh, think maybe three light years, well, actually it's pretty close. Uh, triangulum, not really too sure how far away that one is. But this one here is a photograph of the galaxy taken through my 80 millimeter refractor. Now that is the telescope that you saw me holding up a moment ago. This close up is a photograph taken through my eight inch Schmidt Castlegrain telescope. And that has a larger, whoops, I'm sorry, a larger focal length. So it has greater native magnification. And so it's larger. So that's why you use a larger telescope. You have greater magnification. And that's why I own five telescopes. Only two are used for astrophotography. One is used for observation. Actually, I don't own five, I own four. I have ordered another one and I'll hopefully get it soon. This is the bubble nebula. This is one of my pride and joys. Uh, you can make out the tiny little bubble right there. This was taken fairly recently from St. Michael's. This I'm also very happy with called the Eagle Nebula. That tiny little formation inside is called the Pillars of Creation. I'm particularly happy that I managed to capture that. I, I try to set goals for myself uh, because this is an ongoing journey. Uh, I'm fairly new at astrophotography. I've only been doing it for a couple of years. And so 
it's important when you do this not to set your standards too high. You're not going to get something like the Hubble. Okay. So you, I set the goal of being able to see the bubble and being able to see the pillars of creation when I got it. And when I looked at the data and did a quick, what's called a stretch to see what's there and realized that I'd be able to make out the bubble, I was like hopping up and down. I was so happy, you know, uh, because that was my goal. Will I come back to this again? Yes. Both of these photos were taken at a camera setting of a bin, something called binning. I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna try to avoid jargon as much as possible because astrophotography is filled with it. But it's just a setting that allows you to, makes the camera more light sensitive, but lowers the resolution. So for these two, I was taking at that setting. I've started taking at a setting that is a little bit less light sensitive, but gives me greater resolution. So I'll be able to see finer detail. So I definitely will come back and revisit these uh, again and uh, try to get more detail. Okay, so let's talk about how we do it. This is my location. This is the parking lot at St. Michael's. The little tree's not there anymore. But as you can see, the sky here is wide open. Let me go back and come back to this. It's a, it's a tremendous vantage point. Uh, wide open sky. Right there, that's facing north, but it's low enough for me to see the, the uh, Polaris, the North Star. And the fact that the parking lot is there means that I can power various equipment, because all of it is power hungry, directly from my car and an external battery that I have, which is terrific because these things are power hogs and they will drain the batteries over time. So this location was ideal. I stumbled upon it because I was running around trying to find a place to set up. Uh, and a friend of mine said, who hikes a lot, said, have you ever tried St. Michael's? I said, no, I never heard of it. So she gave me directions and I wandered around to various locations, parking locations and walked in and walked around. And the last one I came to was this one. And I just fell in love. This location was perfect. Uh, there's like one little house that's across the street, several hundred yards away and it's not very brightly lit up. Uh, it's an amazing location. And there were some signs of the head, email addresses. So I emailed a DNR asking uh, permission to set up here. So these are the scopes that I use. The one on the right, the white one, is a refracting telescope. It means it has a bunch of lenses inside it. And here it's set up with my digital single lens reflex camera. It is an 80 millimeter refractor, which means that the opening, the objective, the, the front of the telescope is 80 millimeters wide in diameter. The telescope on the left is a scope that was uh, recently uh, given to me, like uh, the end of last summer, last fall, given to me by a good friend of mine. Uh, this one is a type of telescope called a Schmidt Castle Grain telescope. It's got a mirror back here and then a corrector plate in the front. And this one has, uh, most Schmidt Castle grains have very long focal lengths. This one's not as long. And as a result, it's uh, about as fast, and I'll get to that in a little bit, as this one here. This one's an F6, if you're familiar with photography. This one's an F6.3. This one is heavier. The Schmidt Castle grain is heavier. I've got one weight balancing out the refractor. I have two weights balancing out the Schmidt Castle grain. They're mounted on a uh, relatively small equatorial mount. And equatorial mounts 
are designed that once you line them up with Polaris, or more precisely with uh, Celestial North, which is slightly off of Polaris, then uh, that's this axis here is pointing to Polaris. Then the scope will rotate around that and it will counter the revolution of the Earth so that the star will appear to be standing still in the camera or in your eyepiece if you're looking through it because you're counteracting the rotation of the Earth. However, since uh, guide mechanisms aren't perfect, we use this little thing called a guide camera. Uh, I wasn't guiding when this was taken. This was taken more recently. And the guide camera basically takes the place of a uh, college grad student, okay? Uh, universities or you know professional observatories back in the bad old days to, uh, to counteract the slight drift of the stars for these long exposure photographs, they basically have to have somebody look through a guide scope with the crosshairs trained on a star. And whenever the star would begin to drift a little bit off, that person would have very fine adjustment controls to the telescope and would nudge it back so it would be perfectly centered on the star. So that whatever was being photographed would stay in one place and it wouldn't, wouldn't drift off. And that was usually the job of say a grad student or an assistant astronomer who would have to sit and stare through the telescope for three minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes and make these little nudges, these little adjustments during the time that the exposure was taking place. Well, now the guide scope in the laptop takes the place of that. The mount is controlled by the laptop and the guide scope finds a guide star locks onto it and whenever that guide star slices to drift starts to drift the uh computer using software called phd2 which stands for push here dummy uh will nudge the mount to get the star recentered and so the the guide scope and the guiding software is constantly making tiny tiny corrections to keep the uh the object perfectly in place so it doesn't drift so you don't get elongated stars or blurry images when you're taking a three minute or a five minute or longer exposure and i'm still working on getting my guiding to, to work really really well it works okay for me so far so that's what these cables are all about there's lots of cables involved in astrophotography these are the cameras i showed you the uh dedicated camera this one is a um ASI 294 that I use. My DSR is a Canon T6, not modified. Some people will modify them uh, so that, because there's a filter in all commercial DSLRs that blocks out a certain amount, certain frequency of um, light that we want to still capture. And so they'll cut that filter out and modify it. The mount that I use is a Celestron AVX mount. It's probably their smallest uh, computer controlled uh, German equatorial mount. A larger one would give me better tracking, but because I'm not just set up in my backyard because I have to drive about 20 minutes, half an hour to get to St. Michael's or someplace else that I might be setting up, I have to drag all this stuff out of the car, set it up, a very large mount would be a bit rough on my 65 year old back. So I use a small portable mount. This is what's setting up. So I'm here, uh, sunset is happening right about now. I'm going to record my setup of the telescope. It's not the telescope I normally use. I'm gonna be setting up a uh, Schmidt Castle Grain, eight inch uh, Schmidt Castle Grain uh, F6.2 that a friend of mine gave me. I'll be trying it for the first time tonight. So I'll be testing that telescope out uh, for the first time. It's an old scope, but for me, 
It'd be the first time I've ever used it. Normally I use a refractor. So this is the setup process. I've got the, the mount roughly pointed at uh, Polaris. Hook everything up to it. The mount has to be balanced. So this is a Mead Schmidt Castle Grain F6.3 LX6. And I've got it modified with rings so that it'll go onto a Celestron AVX mount. I had to buy an extra weight. It's a lot heavier than my uh, refractor is. I'm using two uh, Celestron power tanks to power the scope and the camera. The laptop is set up here. I'm actually powering the laptop from my car. I find that I just don't have quite enough power to power everything right now. I'm looking into getting another battery. The camera is a ZWO ASI 294 MC Pro. It's a cooled, dedicated astronomy camera. The guide camera is a uh, Starshoot Auto Guider by Orion. And the guide scope is an Orion uh, 50 millimeter guide scope. There's a little red dot finder on there, and I've also got a little laser mounted on there for right now. I don't always use the laser, but it'll be useful tonight uh, setting up this new scope. And that is about it. So once the scope is set up that's actually only the beginning of the setup process uh i uh will connect the cameras and everything find a bright star manually move the scope to the bright star and focus it doesn't have to be perfectly focused but just get it reasonably well focused and then i go through a sequence of things to, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right now, but I will uh, get the scope very precisely aligned to Celestial North, which involves uh, a piece of software called SharpCap that I use, which it takes a picture of the, using the guide camera, oddly enough, of the North Celestial region region, then you'd rotate the scope on its mount along the uh, the axis that, you know, is pointed at north 90 degrees. It takes another picture. And by using that, it can figure out how far away you are from perfect celestial north. And then you have to make very, very tiny adjustments to, uh, and I'll, whoops, let me go back down to this knob here, and to, there's a knob here and one on the other side back over there. So this and this control very delicately, tilting it up and down, and then this one here and that one there, we'll move it slightly left and right, you know, rotate it slightly left and right. And by making very, very fine adjustments, which can take a bit of time, you can get them out perfectly pointed at Celestial North. Once that's done, I take a bunch of things called correction frames. Remember I said that an astrophotographer is always fighting against two things, uh, the movement of the planet, Earth, and noise. So by setting this up perfectly aligned to celestial north, perfectly polar aligned, and then using the guiding, I can fight the movement. To fight the noise, you take a series of 
calibration frames. And you use something, and I'll just go down to this one, something called astrophotography tools. And you, I take a bunch of frames with a white t-shirt stretched over the front of the camera and the light from like a drawing, illuminated drawing pad turned down dim. Those are called flat frames. And basically you're finding out where the dust and stuff is in your light train. By finding that out, computer programs can take that away. Then you take photographs with the uh, lens cap on. I take dark flats, something called biases. And at home, I can take dark frames. I, I have a dark library that you can use over and over and over again. And that is basically taking photographs of the type of noise that the camera itself makes so that that can be subtracted. Once that is done, you're ready to set up in astrophotography tools, or there's a lot of different ones that can control this uh, sequence generator. There's one called NINA. I don't know what it stands for, N-I-N-A. But what I do here is using this, I can tell my camera, I'll, I'll move my camera to, let's say the bubble nebula. And then I'll tell it, take a certain number of photographs. So I can set up the length of exposure. This says 300 seconds here, something called the binning that says one by one, how many photographs to take. Um, you can set up a bunch of other things with the camera like gain, whatnot. And for a digital single lens, you'd be setting up the ISO, the exposure length. So basically, I typically take three minute exposures and I usually take them in batches of 30. And I do something in between each photograph called dithering. Yes, I know that's what it's actually called, dithering, um, where the telescope mount actually is told to move a tiny amount before it takes the next photograph in a random direction. Uh, the idea is that the software I go to next will line things up, but uh, the noise won't. So anyway, at that point, I get back in my car and I wait for an hour and a half while it takes three, 30 three minute exposures. Then I check focus and all that jazz and I'll do it again. And then I'll do that all night long. So let's talk about processing. So let's say I get 30 photos. Processing will take an image from something like this to like this. I'll put those photos into something called Deep Sky Stacker, which basically combines all of them together. What this will do is increase the signal to noise ratio. Stacking them all together increases the noise from one photo by a factor of 10, but it increases the signal, the picture you want to keep by a factor of 100. Deep Sky Stacker produces something that looks like this, not very impressive. I then go into Photoshop. I take the image into Photoshop and I process it and process it and process it. This is called stretching to bring out the data that's there, but very faint and to increase uh, contrast, sharpness, et cetera, and I process it and process it. And there's a saying that we used to have when I was on art panels at uh, science fiction conventions. Uh, what every artist needs is a large man to stand behind them with a mallet to make him stop. And it's true when you're doing a painting, and it's also true when you're processing a photograph. You can over-process them. And so this is what the final, 
And I finally made myself stop. And this is what the final looked like for the uh, Bobo Nebula. And I was very happy that I could see the bubble right there. So those are the slides that I have. I just want to check very quickly to see if, oops, I'm sorry, I did not want that pulled up. I want, did I have, no, but let me look in this one. I was looking to see if I, uh, yes. I just wanted to point out that um, I was actually at St. Michael's Monday night in all night. I got, I got done at like five in the morning. And I, I photographed two things. I was testing a bunch of other things, uh, trying to, get, to make some slight adjustments to focus, uh, to what's something called back focus. And I photographed this photo of the crab and everything. This is a very quick processing of it, if it'll come up. Uh, that's a very quick photo of the of the crab nebula. I made a bonehead mistake, and I was when I was fiddling out with the back focus, and the camera got rotated, so I had horrible dust spots that didn't get taken out by the flat planes. But that was taken just Monday night of the crab nebula. The crab nebula is about six thousand light years away. I'm not really thrilled with this one. However, I also took a photo that is a vast improvement over my last one of Bode's Nebula. And I was really happy with this galaxy here. Uh, one of the things is that um, with this one by one binning, I have a lot more detail. So I've got a lot more subtle detail in there of this galaxy here and this irregular galaxy here. And this is much better than my last attempt at uh, Bode's Nebula, which is on my website. I'm very happy with that. I can make out some subtlety in, in the arms here. But this was, I literally processed this uh, this morning. So that's why I couldn't put it into my slideshow. So at this point, uh, I think we have about 15 minutes left. Um, I could show other photos, but I think I'd rather take questions uh, that you might have. If there are no questions, I have photos that I cut out of this slideshow to make it a sane length. I can always pull those up, but I'd rather take questions if, pe if people have questions. Uh, Taylor, this is Linda Mead. Yes. Um, so uh, we have a few questions that came through in the chat. So let me ask you those. And I would re you know, recommend if anyone has any questions to add, please add them to the chat and we will address them. So the first was a technical question. I have a DOB 12 inch 300P telescope. Do you have any recommendations for camera video for a scope of my size? Okay, DOB, uh, Dobsonian 12 inch what? 300P. Okay. Um, if, if I understand you right, you've got a 12 inch Dobsonian. That's a great, it's a great uh, telescope for observational astronomy, but uh, a Dobsonian mount is a mount that, um, let me just show you. Uh, it's a very simple mount. Looks kind of like that there, all right? And uh, it won't, generally speaking, track. Um, if you want to take a photograph with the Dobbs of, say, um, a planet, something like that, planetary cameras are very different than uh, the type of camera that I have. They basically take videos. And ZWO makes good planetary cameras. Uh, you have to take very, very short burst video because the planet's going to be moving. But really, to take, if your Dobsonian is on an as, I, I don't want to, 
I don't want to get into too much jargon. And as alt mount is a mount that goes up and down a Dobsonian surf like that, uh, some of them are uh, motorized. If it's on a motorized mount that will track a little bit, you can definitely take pictures of planets and very short exposures of nebula. Uh, start with an inexpensive camera and, and make sure you really want to get into this because these are expensive. The camera that that red camera that I use cost a thousand dollars. I started out just using my digital single lens reflex because I already had one. Uh, some of them, sometimes for reflector telescopes, you cannot get focus with a um, digital single lens reflex, so it can be tricky. Mm -hmm. So here's another technical question, Taylor. Um, what shutter speeds do you use with or without tracking? Is there a difference? Okay, yeah. Um, for something like this, and actually, you know what? To answer that question, let me go to here, but let me go to astrophotography. This is my website. And the reason I'm going here is that um, I may, I have technical data here. So like for instance, this galaxy here was taken with a single lens reflex, single lens reflex. The ISO was 800 and there were seven 300 second exposures. So this was um, five minutes. I typically do uh, three minute, 180 second exposures. If you're not tracking and you wanted to take a picture of just the Milky Way, okay? Um, like, uh, I don't know if I have a shot of just the Milky Way here. Uh, here back up then you're limited to like 10 seconds 15 seconds because if you're not tracking you've got problems this one was a 30 second sub and the there's some elongation of my uh so this was a 30 second exposure uh with iso 1600 and this was probably a 50 millimeter lens. So it's not zooming in at all. The more you zoom in, the shorter your exposure has to be. You're not going to get longer than say 30 seconds. You're using actual telescope and zooming in five seconds, three seconds, two second exposures. If you're not tracking at best, you really need to track because you're fighting the movement of the stars. Mm -hmm. So in regard to that, um, is there a GPS connection that helps you set up and find the star of interest? Oh, very, okay, very, very good question. Um, let me go back to just to this. This mount is what's called a go-to mount. So one of the things that I do when I, after I've done a polar alignment, I do a star alignment. I set the mount up to its starting position and turn it on and using the handset here, I say align mount. And the mount will slew or go to a star and it'll say, make fine adjustments and get this in the center of your eyepiece or your camera. So I'll adjust that and get it to the center of my screen on astrophotography and then hit align. Then it'll pick another star because it, it thinks it knows where you are because you tell it, I tell it I'm located in Trenton, New Jersey. It's pointing at the pole. It knows what the date and time is. So it has a general idea of where it is. Once you go through the star alignment routine, it knows very precisely where everything is. So I can then just say, go to the bubble nebula or, or go to e the Eagle Nebula or M16, and it will automatically go to that object. I can say, go to Mars. And if Mars is up, it'll automatically go to that object. Or I can say, go to the star Betelgeuse and it'll go there. So once you've aligned your scope, the mount really, 
It's called a go-to mount because you can just say, go to this object and it will automatically go there. It's fascinating. So Taylor, let's switch to another topic, which is what age did you become interested in astrophotography? There's been a couple <laughs> questions about how you got involved in this fascinating field and, and how that came about for you. Let me see if I can find that on here. Do I have that? There's some things I put at the last minute. I don't know if I put it on here or not. No, I don't have a picture of my first scope. Uh, I'll just talk about it. Uh, oh, no, I do have it right here. Now, this isn't the actual scope I had, but when I was a kid, I got a scope. Come on, if it'll load. Maybe this one doesn't, this, this format doesn't want to load here. Okay. Um, I had a two inch telescope, two inch diameter that, oh, there it is. Um, my mother got for me at a store called Corvettes. And you, unless you're my age, you have no idea, you've never heard of Corvettes. It was a de department store, like, you know, Macy's or Target or whatever. And my scope looked very much like this one you see on the screen now, only it was a, a green and not a white. And so when I was like, Early, I was always been interested in astronomy and science fiction and science. And I probably had this when I was in like fifth grade, sixth grade, middle school. And I can remember a, a lot of my students ask me, like, what's the coolest thing you've ever done in science? And I tell them the coolest memory I have is the very first time I saw the rings of Saturn with my own eyes. And it was through a telescope very much like this one, or if not exactly like this one, you know, uh, that I, I saw the rings of Saturn and it was tiny and I focused it and it was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And so I've always been in love with science and love with astronomy. It's a lifelong love. And uh, even when I went, went into the arts, I ended up going into the arts where I was doing science fiction artwork and painting galaxies and things like that. And now I'm sort of back where I started, you know, looking through a telescope. So Taylor, somebody's asking as a beginner, what's a, what is a small telescope to start with? Uh, yeah, that, <laughs> I tell people, you know, if you ask 10 different uh, astronomers what the best beginner telescope is, you'll get 12 different answers. Um, Although we generally will agree, the best telescope is the one that you'll use. And, and, and that sounds flippant, but it's actually very serious because if you're somebody that doesn't like fiddling and setting something up, you don't want a telescope mm. that might be a great telescope, but it's gonna take you a half an hour or 45 minutes to set it up in your backyard to use it. Maybe you want one that may not have as great an optic, but you can just grab it and plop it in your backyard and start using it. Uh, if you're interested in just uh, observational astronomy, uh, these Dobsonians like this, some of these are more expensive, but you can find inexpensive Dobsonians. These aren't go-to mounts. You have to be able to find an object in the sky. Um, let's see. 130 SLR or SLT. Uh, the scope that I use for um, observation is this thing here. Uh, it's a good scope. You cannot put a single lens reflex into it and take photos. Because I tried, that's why I ended up buying another, another scope. This is a go-to mount. It'll find the stars for you. It's a very, very nice scope. The setup is pretty quick, but if you're just starting, really just, and just wanna try looking through a scope, there are inexpensive Dobsonians that cost like $60, you know, under $100. You're not investing a lot of money just to look at the stars, look at the moon, look at the planets. Fantastic. So there, somebody sent a, um a link to uh, a uh, scale of the universe two, 
which is really quite fascinating. If anybody has a chance to look at it, it's htwins.net slash scale two slash. And it's really fascinating. I took a very quick look at it. Um, I have lots of uh, comments here, Taylor, people thanking you for the brilliance, for the presentation. Um, this, this one just came in. What is the thing that is attached to your refractor telescope that has a red backlit screen? A red backlit Oh, oh, oh okay. Um, I think you are referring, let me go to that. I think it's that thing there. That is the hand controller for the, um, the mount. That's the one where you push a bunch of bunch buttons and say, you know, take me to Mars or take me to M31 or whatever. And it'll con that's the controller. Uh, I can control my mount through my laptop or through the hand controller. Uh, so that's, and that's also what I use to set up the mount to get it aligned. So I'm assuming that's what they're talking about right there. Right. Well, I think as we bring this to conclusion, you know, I want to thank you, Taylor. This has been a fascinating talk. Obviously, by all the comments we received, we are recording this. It will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. We send out regular emails. If you're not on our email list and you saw this in a press release, by all means, make sure that you sign up, go to DNR Greenway's website, drgreenway.org and sign up to receive our regular emails. So you can learn about more programs like this one. And thank you, Marsha, for your comment. Hip, hip, hooray for the DNR to make this land available to Taylor and all who yes, love space. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. We will continue to make this available to you, Taylor. And um, again, just noting on May 16th, we have a virtual program coming up. You'll be notified through the emails. And um, we went up for this one up into space. And for, for the next one, we'll go down with archaeology. So there'll be lots of fascinating science there, as well as history um, going back to Native Americans 13,000 years ago. Um, so thank you everyone for joining DNR Greenway. Thanks very much, Taylor Blanchard. This was fascinating and we look forward to hearing from you again. I mentioned just two things very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody has any questions, uh, my website is intaylorblanchard.com and there is an email link here. So um, if like, you uh, are thinking about getting a telescope for your kids or for yourself and you have questions about it, I'm happy to answer. You, just, you can just email me that way uh, to, uh, if, you know, if you have any questions about, you know, about what I've been talking about, if anything wasn't clear, that sort of thing. Okay. And actually, that's just the one thing. I just wanted to mention, I'm happy to answer questions if somebody uh, had any questions for me on that. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much for being so generous and sharing all of this. So thank you, everyone. We'll let you go to your dinners now. And, uh, and thank you for being part of DNR Greenway's community online. Again, it's great to see everybody again. And someday we'll see you in person. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>